Hey everyone, Victor is here and in this video I want to talk about the COPE rearrangement which is a thermal isomerization of one 5 dienes, which means that nearly any molecule with this basic template, with this basic structure, could potentially undergo the COPE rearrangement for as long as it can curl itself into the ring structure. So if I look at my starting material, the atoms that are going to be participating in my reaction are the 1 through 6 that I numbered over here. So this part of the structure is what is actually going to be reacting, while the rest of the structure is just going to be substituents that are only marginally relevant to us. To make it easier to track where things are, I am also going to number the atoms in my final product, so this way we can see that we broke the bond between carbons 3 and 4 in the original molecule, and we made a new bond between carbons 1 and 6, also, the pi bond migrated from atoms uh, 1 and 2 and 5 and 6 all the way to atoms 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. So essentially you're kind of flip-flopping your single and double bonds uh, across this molecule. Now, when it comes to the mechanism of this reaction, mechanistically speaking this is a pericyclic reaction, which means that the transition state in this reaction is going to be a cyclic transition state. So for the purposes of the curved arrows, it actually doesn't matter how exactly we draw our curved arrows. I could draw them, let's say, clockwise, like so, when they are going around the molecule, or if I feel like I can draw them in the opposite direction like so, which is going to be exactly the same difference for the purposes of this mechanism. And of course, as a result of this reaction, we are going to get the molecule that we already knew that we are going to be getting here. Now, the important thing about this reaction is that this reaction is a thermal equilibrium, which means that we are going to end up with some amount of our starting material, and we are also going to end up with our final product, and they are going to be at equilibrium with each other. Since this is an equilibrium, the reaction typically going to favor the formation of the more stable alkene. And often, we are going to see the ratios of 1 to 5 or 1 to 6 given or take between our starting material and final product, provided that the final product is more stable, of course. In this particular case that I have here on the screen, in my starting material I have one double bond and second double bond with only one substituent each, however in my product I have a double bond with two substituents and another one with one substituent, so this double bond on top, that one is actually a more thermodynamically stable double bond, so we would expect that to be our major product. Now, this is of course an example that you are going to see in your textbook or anywhere else on the internet. How about we look at something that you might actually see on the test? Let's say we have something like that, and you might argue that this molecule really doesn't look like what I just had on the screen a moment ago, and you would be correct, but here is the deal. Molecules don't have to be presented to you in the most convenient way possible. At the end of the day, this molecule is still a 1,5-diene. So if I highlight my diene over here, my main parent chain, and I number it through, we can see that one double bond is at the carbon number 1, and the other double bond is at the carbon number 5, so it is in fact a 1,5-diene, it is an open chain, so it could potentially curl itself into the uh, cyclic structure which, if I carefully redraw my molecule, going to look like this. In this case, my atoms 1, 2 and 3 are over here, then this is my atom number 4, my atom number 5, and finally my atom number 6. Now, this already looks a little bit more like what we are used to seeing in reactions like that, and now if you like, we can show our uh, curved arrows here, so I'll do it uh, clockwise, this guy goes here, these electrons go here, those electrons go there, and as a result, we are going to get the following product, where we have just broke the bond between atoms 4 and 3, made a new bond between atoms 1 and 6, and flip-flop the position of our double bonds. Now, in this case, looking at my double bonds, I can see that my top double bond over here has two substituents, and likewise my bottom double bond over here also has two substitutions unlike what I had in my starting material. Now, one other thing that I want to mention here is that we are going to be seeing E and Z stereoisomers in these molecules, however, the 
exact nature of the stereochemistry here, the exact stereo descriptors that we are going to get, does depend on the stereochemistry of the original molecule. And while stereochemistry of this particular reaction goes beyond the scope of this video, I will talk about that at some point in the future, so for right now we are not going to really care about the stereochemistry, so if you want to draw your double bonds as E or Z, that is just as fine for our purposes. In my experience, most instructors do not care about the stereochemistry of these reactions within the scope of the introductory organic chemistry, however, if you look at that within the scope of the more advanced class, you are definitely going to be talking about the stereochemistry of all types of pericyclic reactions. And with that in mind, let's move on to the next example over here. Now, a really cool thing about the coup rearrangement is that this reaction can easily be used in the formation of the large rings. So what I have over here, I've got this four-membered ring which is very strained. So if I have an opportunity for this ring to burst open, it will definitely do so and it will be energetically favorable for this molecule. Looking carefully at this molecule, I can see that I have my 1,5-diene right over here, so if I renumber my atoms as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, I can see that I'm going to be making a new bond between 1 and 6, I'm going to be breaking a bond between uh, 3 and 4 here, so to make my life a little bit easier here to track my atoms, I'm also going to be naming the atoms of this four-membered ring as extra atom A and extra atom B, because they are going to end up in my final molecule, in my final structure. And after thinking carefully about which atoms I am connecting here and which bonds I am breaking, I am going to end up with the final structure looking like this, where my atoms 1, 2 and 3 are right over here, my atoms 4, 5 and 6 are these ones, and my atoms A and B are right on the left side of my macrocycle here. So I ended up making an eight-membered ring, which would be somewhat of a challenge to make otherwise. Also, because the starting material has a very strained ring, this reaction we would expect to have a 100% conversion and we are not going to expect much of the starting material, if any, at all. And while we are talking about the formation of the macro rings via this reaction, here is another interesting example. Now, in this case, I again have my 1,5-diene right over here, the highlighted portion of the molecule, so if I number my atoms, I'll do number 1, 2 and 3 here, then 4, 5 and 6 like so, which means that now I'm going to be making a new bond between 1 and 6, breaking a bond between 4 and 3, so let's call this atom of a three-membered ring as an atom A, and to make it a little bit easier to visualize how exactly all of that is going to work, let me redraw this molecule like this. So now, if I look at this molecule and I renumber all of my atoms in exactly the same fashion, I have atom 1, atom 2, atom 3, now this is my atom A, then I have my atom 4, my atom 5, and finally I have the atom number 6 over here. So I'm going to be making a new bond between 1 and 6, breaking a bond between 3 and 4, flip-flopping my double bonds, and as a result, I'm going to get a molecule looking like this, where my atoms 1, 2, and 3 are over here, this one is my atom A, then I have my atom 4, 5 and 6. So as you can see, the cope rearrangement can be a very versatile way of making really complex cyclic structures and potentially make molecules that will be extremely difficult to make otherwise. But there is another really cool variation of this reaction called oxy cope rearrangement. So if we have a molecule and in the third position we have an OH group, going through the steps of this reaction we are going to end up with the corresponding product. So, mechanistically speaking, there is nothing new here. Our electrons move the same way, we have the same style transition state, everything is the same. The big difference here, however, is that once we get our product, we have this 
enol functional group sitting in our molecule, and enols are inherently unstable, which means that this molecule can easily undergo the keto enol tautomerism, giving us the corresponding carbonyl and aldehyde in this particular example. And since keto enol tautomerism typically favors the formation of the carbonyl, that will be essentially removing molecule from the equilibrium, and these type of reactions, they typically give you predominantly the carbonyl as the product, regardless of the stability of the initial alkene and what the stability of the intermediate might have been. So, for instance, let's say we look at this molecule. Well, in this case, I can see that I have a 1,5-diene and I have an OH group in the third position on the third carbon. If I redraw my molecule in a more cyclic shape so it's a little bit easier to visualize, I am going to get a molecule looking like this, where my atoms 1, 2, and 3 on top, my atoms 4, 5 and 6 are over here on the bottom of the molecule, so I can visualize that I'm going to be making a new bond between 1 and 6, breaking a bond between 3 and 4, flip-flopping my double bonds, eventually giving me the following enol as my intermediate, which, after undergoing the keto enol tautomerism here, going to give me the following final aldehyde as my final product. And again, in this case, the stability of my double bond was essentially irrelevant. And potentially, this reaction can give you really cool outcomes. Let's look at this example over here. While this molecule might not necessarily look like our typical cope rearrangement starting material, I do in fact have a 1,5-diene right over here in this part of the molecule. So I can number my atoms here as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So I do have a 1,5-diene, I do have an OH on the third carbon, so that is going to be an oxycope rearrangement. And by carefully drawing my product connecting atoms 1 and 6 and breaking the bond between 3 and 4, I'm going to get the following intermediate. Now, like in the previous example and the original problem that I have here on the screen, this is going to be an enol, so we are going to do the keto-enol tautomerism and get the corresponding carbonyl. So in this case, we ended up making a 10-membered ring, which would be a real challenge to make using other chemistry. Not impossible, but again, quite challenging. So from the purely synthetic standpoint, the cope rearrangement is an incredibly powerful and important reaction, and it has been used in many total synthesis and targeted synthesis of different um, industrially and medically important molecules. But there is another really cool version of this reaction called Kleisen rearrangement, which is all almost like the cope rearrangement, but it has a little bit of a twist. And I'm going to talk about the Kleisen rearrangement in my next video. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that one. And as always, thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, boop that like button and let me know about that in the comments below. Check out this video next and I will see you next time.